Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Today's special guest is Paul Tobin. You know him as the writer of My Date with Monsters from Aftershock Comic Books. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Mr. Tobin. Welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. I'm glad to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. So um, I, I got um, I always get to read your work, and it's fantastic. I've definitely enjoyed um, your current work, My Date with Monsters. It's a pleasure to read it. Thank you. So in reading that book, I couldn't help but think, what inspired that book to get made? Because it, it's, it's a fascinating read. It, 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 I really like it. It's unique as hell. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's got a few genres to it, I'd have to say. Um, it originally stemmed from, uh, I, I just really love the, the combination of genres. And I've had a love affair with, uh, with Japanese yokai in, in particular for a long time. Uh, and then the monsters across the world. Japan has like a really good tradition of, of monsters and they seem to have like quirkier ones. So they've always been in my, in my head. Um, and then my friend Patrick Reynolds asked if I wanted to do a, a project together and that project kind of fell through, but my date with monsters kind of built from there because the ideas were in my head and um, the idea of the dream world is always important to me. Um, I tend to have dream worlds in my, in some of my horror work because um, I, I feel like the, the waking line is, is kind of small and I'm a guy who has quite a few nightmares and quite a few dreams. and um, you know, there's always those moments when you wake up from a nightmare and you're, you're kind of breathing hard and going, okay, is this real? Okay, I'm not on a train falling through space. So apparently it's not real. <laughs> um, but uh, but part of the dream world kind of like worked its way in. And then uh, so many so many internet lists about the horrors of dating. And like <laughs> a lot of my single friends, um, like talking about oh you will not believe this person and things like that and i and i so the combination of the horror of the monsters and the horror of just interpersonal human relationships mm. um with romance as the standby here kind of like all coalesced in my head into this project well i'm going to interrupt the fluidity of the interview just for one second and point out your background is freaking awesome are those are those original artwork yeah, I collect original art. I have a yeah. I think that's there's a badass like, background. <laughs> <laughs> there's like two or three hundred pieces of art up in my place. Oh my god! I forget what's back there. Yeah, there's an original Graham Ingalls EC page there, and a Stan Goldberg Millie the Model. You might oh, be able wow. to see a, a, a Jack Kirby Captain America page back there. A Richard Sala page. I'm a huge Sala fan, so. That is absolutely amazing. I I love um, original artwork. I, I can't ever afford it because you know teacher salary. But um, that is... I can't afford it anymore. The the prices are just <laughs> insane. There's no way I could afford my collection. Well, like I, I, I I'm really old, so like <laughs> so like I have a Frank Miller Daredevil page, and you know if somebody offered me sixty thousand dollars for it, I'd say no. Jesus, um, <laughs> I remember buying it for $75. Oh so. my God. <laughs> well, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, there was in the news about a week ago, maybe three days ago, there was the original page of the first retroactive parents of Venom, and uh, early Spider-Man in the black costume, mm -hmm. went for seven figures at an yeah. auction. Jesus. Almost three and a half million dollars. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, um, your Frank Miller one is probably going worth better than 60 nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. I've been watching like, it's fun in one way to watch the prices of my original art go up. But yeah. also, I don't have any intention of selling. So what they're worth isn't that important to me. But the bad part of it is, is like you said, I can't, I can't afford this stuff anymore. Like yeah. there's very few pages in my collection that if they went up for sale today at the prices they would get that I wouldn't even think about getting. And it's just, it's weird. Yeah. There there's a, there's a website. I, I go on to buy comic books from time to time called mycomicshop.com because mm -hmm. um, the, the local shop doesn't carry back issues. And every once when they have an auction, they always, sometimes they have original artwork. So I'm just for fun. I'm like, Oh, bet. Oh, I'll wait. I'll put in 60 bucks, you know? And I'm looking at like, and for like, and for like two days, it's the winning bet. I was like, holy shit. Can you get for a second? Then it ends up like a thousand dollars. Like, oh, whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like for two days, I was so excited. And then it's like, yeah, no, I go through that all close. the time myself. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's really disappointing. But yeah, um, original artwork is definitely well, well, I'll price me. It's, 
it, it's amazing how what was definitely an outcast that would a thing of like comic books was like the outcast the geek thing you know the basement mm-hmm. thing that you kept has now become so mainstream that it's been priced out of the 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 walls of those who used to buy that's the collection yeah you know <laughs> yeah, I have a collection of, like Golden Age comics and like uh, like key Marvels, and there's no way I could afford to have those anymore yeah. either to buy those. I mean, I'm glad I got the ones that I got. I mean, I I have some really nice ones, but yeah, I couldn't come close to affording them anymore. No, um, I I have I think two no three Golden Age comic books that I was able to buy because once I mean I say I bought them at auction and stuff like that. Uh, one uh, two were Captain uh, Captain Marvel or you know Shazam. Mm-hmm. And one was um, an EC combo. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was like mm-hmm. 1950, like one, something like that. And I think I spent 50 bucks on each of them. And they're so cherished. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, love them. I love the Fawcett comics too, the Captain Marvel ones and things like that. And this... yeah, I probably have maybe two or 300 Golden Age and then probably oh God. like maybe 10 of what I would consider like key Marvels, FF1, Avengers 1, First Daredevil, First Iron Man, stuff like that. Well, definitely hide your address because your house, your your house, apparently very valuable right now. <laughs> it's like it's like a gold mine in, in, in your uh, in your place. <laughs> I, I have I have a lot of knives around. I will defend my my loves. <laughs> oh my god! If my if there's ever anyone breaks into my house, first I'll, I'll protect my wife because I'm on camera. Camera, I gotta say that. But number two, mm-hmm. comic books, and then the pets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. Yeah. And I, I have to say, wife, because she's just literally sitting right over there. So <laughs> she's watching. She's like, right answer, motherfucker. Right answer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, the comic books that you do your that, that you create yourself, and you, and you create a, um, you create a, a lot of great ones. Mm-hmm. Do you have a place on your wall for the ones that you've done yourself? No, that gets kind of, um, I don't know, I, I feel kind of weird about having them on the wall, but now having pointed out that like, like, um, that my wife is sitting right over here, I have a lot of her art, Colleen, Colleen Coover is my wife, and I have a lot of her art on the wall, because she's, she's literally my favorite artist in the world, so I like Aww. to put her art up, but Good yeah, answer. I don't think she <laughs> likes it on the wall that much, um, First of all, like some of it, I, I remember so nostalgically. So some of it is like 20 years old and she's, mm. you know, rightfully become a far better artist since then. So I walk by and have like these fond memories of, oh, look at that beautiful piece. And she's like, yeah, look how I drew that arm. Whoa, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say that's a very good answer that you gave that, that saves you for the day. <laughs> for when. <laughs> but yeah, I, well, I will say, um, as, as you know, um, for my comics, I will say I do have a Vandy wall. It, it, it wasn't the space image you see the like comics books behind me because you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm as as a, some writers arrogant shit. I'm like, hey, look, my shit. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it it, it but it, like I said, it must be amazing to not only have that love for comic books all going back to the golden age, but supplying your own, such as um, my date with monsters. It, it must be a hell of a feeling. Yeah, it it, it does feel good. Um, like getting fan mail is is big for me, and like. The ones that like I love doing the horror stuff, like uh, like Bunny Mask and and Colder are two of my all time favorite, and My Day with Monsters. Um, but I also do like all ages stuff, like the Plants vs Zombies mm. um, graphic novels, and the fan mail I get from those is often means the most to me because there are mothers that will say my child literally learned how to read so that he could read your comic or, you know, a picture of a kid holding up a Plants vs. Zombies graphic novel and, you know, saying this is literally the first thing I've ever read in my life. And it's mm. like, that's, that's kind of heartwarming and, and I feel the responsibility there. So yeah, it, it does feel good to be a creator. It, it definitely must. And so your current one is my day with monsters. Can you give our listeners your pitch for the series, given a sense of, of what the story is about? Um, basically, it's about a woman who, who um, became involved with dream research, and it it went entirely wrong. Um, and dreams have broken through into the world, and the world has sort of uh, gotten used to it. Now and then, they have dream breakouts, and they're always nightmares. They're monsters that come in, and they're dangerous. Um, but there are ways to go around it. There's a there's some pills called blanket, which allow you to sleep without dreams. Um, but there are certain focal points um, in the world that if they could close, they could close the dreams, the nightmares. And uh, Risa, the main character, her daughter, 
Maki is one of those focal points. And each of the focal points has a certain way of getting it solved. And it's solved their trauma, basically. And Maki wants her mother, Risa, the main character, to fall in love. So while Risa is fighting monsters and trying to save the world, um, she's also trying to meet a guy that's not a complete jerk. Um, <laughs> so she can fall in love. So as you mentioned, the, the, the pill blanket that stops people from having dreams, right? Mm -hmm. What is the impact on not dreaming for the individual? Because I mean, most of us do have dreams. Some of us have dreams that we have and um, definitely maybe even cherish um, that, that we've had at night. Losing the ability to dream, what is the impact on that on the individual? Um, the blanket pills are pretty good with that. We actually deal with that in the series that a lot of dream suppressants um, really are not healthy for you because like you say, there's, there's reasons you dream and it interrupts your sleep if you're not dreaming and things like that. So long-term effects of not dreaming are very bad for you. The blanket pills kind of um, do a, a substitute in a way and, and allow the, the chemicals and things like that. But it is something that um, depending on how far we go into it, um, I, I will say that blanket pills are better for you, but that doesn't mean that they're great, you know? Yeah. So it, it is a long-term thing. So the, the nightmares that you said that get unleashed, especially um, while people are dreaming, are they specific to the dreamer or are they just a doorway of where the nightmares enter, but the, the nightmares that enter the physical world not necessarily connected to the dreams of that dreamer? They're more just a, a doorway. The, the, the person having a nightmare opens a doorway. Um, we haven't really dealt with, and I don't really plan on like, you know, it being tinged with the dreamer itself because they are literally open a doorway to another door so, or to another world. So I don't want them like the nightmares to say, oh, this guy also had a, you know, a top hat. In his <laughs> well, I'll put on a top hat. They're not here to perform or to play a role. They're, mm. they're here to, um, well, that's actually why they're here is one of the big parts of the series that, that, that um, we'll get to in later issues. <laughs> I mean, I, I just love the idea of discussing and, and looking into the dreams and the nightmare worlds. I mean, that's such a fascinating concept because I think that's something that we all share, but there's such a uniqueness and, and there's such a fantasy-esque aspect to dreams that I think it's just amazing that, we're, that you get to explore in your story. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite fascinated with dreams. I'm, I'm a person who dreams a lot. Like, like I have wild epic dreams almost on a nightly basis and a nightmare maybe every week or so. Um, while my wife um, rarely remembers her dreams, you know, she probably gets really bored when I wake up and say, so last night, here's what happened, you know, and things like that. Because, you know, hearing, listening to someone talk about their dreams can be kind of boring. <laughs> my, 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 my wife likes to share her dreams. And, but I will say they're fascinating in case she listens. <laughs> in case she ever decides to, to tune in, I'll be like, they're, they're, they are fascinating to listen. They're to. just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yes. Of course they are. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, that must be an exciting thing for you to experience these dreams on a regular basis, like especially the epic ones. It, 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 it must be such an interesting or maybe even motivational sense to, of going to sleep and experiencing that and what you come out with after you, when you do wake up, that those, and I think me as well, very rarely remembers their dreams, don't get to enjoy. Yeah, it is enjoyable. I even have like um, serial dreams where, where um, like they're episodic, episodic, like, you know, there's houses or adventures that I go on that, that like, not necessarily the next night, but maybe a month later, I'll, I'll pick up from there and, and the adventure continues and things like that. So yeah, it's kind of like subscribing to a series. You know, it's like your brain doing the writing for you. You wake up, you're like, "That's a, that's my next story right there." Thank you, brain. It, it <laughs> Thank happens. you, dream brain. <laughs> there, there are times when I wake up and I remember a line or something that somebody said in a dream, and I'm like, "That is a better line than I have ever written awake." <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> so for now, you got to have a your um, pages while you're sleeping. See if you can sleep right your next story. <laughs> Let your brain I, handle it. I uh, I used to put a little notepad notepad near my bed so I could write down stuff and, and remember it and I gave it up because a lot of the time I would just be too sleepy to do it but mm -hmm. like one morning I woke up and I had remembered that like oh I remember writing it down because it was such a good I couldn't remember the dream itself but I remembered how fascinating and wonderful it was 
and I picked up my note bat, notepad and I had written down cowboy fire and I'd circled it several times and wrote important. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized then that my, my sleepy, like three in the morning, you know, mind was never going to cohesively write down my ideas. Oh, I, I will say I have made the mistake a few times of waking up in the middle of the night with, with a great just scenes of dialogue in my head, you know, like wake up with, cause um, you know, for, for some of the stories I work on, I'm like, man, I'm gonna remember that when I wake up, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know in a few hours I wake up, I'm just like, I have none nope. of it. I, I got yeah. nothing. <laughs> I, got, I know there was an idea. I knew the dialogue was just how I wanted to write it. Right. And I, I made the mistake of going right back to bed and I blew it off. <laughs> I, do that. I do that in the daytime sometimes when I'm just like, you know, sitting around and I'll get an idea and I'm like, that is such a beautiful idea that there's no reason for me to write it down because I will remember it forever. And then like 20 minutes later, I'm like, nah, gone. Yeah, it, it, you really got to do it at that exact point. Like there's a moment of inspiration where everything is just right. And mm -hmm. the moment that slips, it's like, it's, yeah. it's like, it's like losing, you know, like your remote control in the couch where you're like, you can never find it. <laughs> it's gone yeah. forever. Yep. <laughs> exactly. But I think one interesting, I think I love about your story is the idea of focal points and having to overcome trauma to close to focal points. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one question I, I do have, um, maybe because it's based, maybe the question came from myself because I'm kind of a pessimistic person who's very rarely like satisfied with things. <laughs> and what do you do about the people who are just not easily satisfied, you know, made happy and likely some people are just inherently miserable people. I mean, yeah, so far I haven't dealt with any focal points like that. It's been like very, um, like one person wanted to be famous, one person wanted to be rich, one person just wanted to be left alone. Um, um, but yeah, some people, like you say, are a little more complex. It's not a, you know, it's not a A, B, one, two um, binary solution. So, and I think Risa is, is you know, by far the most complicated because it's not like solving her um, or solving Ma Maki, the daughter who has the trauma, just wants her, mo her mom mm. to be in love. That's, being in love is, is not a, a binary thing either. It's not like, a, you know, especially I think, uh, like a 12 year old and Maki is 12 um, their version of what adult love means can often be you know the white horse and the prince and the princess and things like that and everybody will be you know happy 100 percent of the time and if two people argue then obviously they're not in love like how could two people who are arguing be in love you know things like that so so Risa is is by far the hardest to um to uh to solve and, and Risa isn't really um that much in the idea of being in love either so well i mean risa obviously knows that her happiness or in, in this relationship connects to closing the focal point in, in maki mm -hmm. so i mean dating is hard enough as it is making a connection is hard enough as it is the pressure for risa to know that she kind of has to fall in love to cut this out does, how mm -hmm. bad does that complicate the emotion because once again it's not just the natural, I mean, it's going to be all dated that there's a natural effect when you meet with someone and it's just, you know, it just clicks. But mm -hmm. the pressure added onto that you are trying to force it to happen. Mm -hmm. How much does that complicate Reza's ability to find that person? Hugely. <laughs> I, mean, I hate to give a one word answer, but yeah, it's huge. Because once you're told to do something, your natural response is to, or at least mine is, is to, you know, fight against it, depending on what I'm told. You know, if it's right, right. If I'm told, hey, pick up that chocolate chip cookie and eat it, it's like, yeah, we can reach an accord. Um, right, right. But, you know, but if it's like do this, you know, hard thing, then I'm like, I'm gonna rebel against it. So she she does have problems with that, um, which she talks through with Maki to a certain extent, and then um Croak, who's a, a troll, who's <laughs> who's who's a main character. Great in character. Um, and she talks about it with him a lot. Um, in a way, he's an actual monster, um, and but in a way, her her really only confidant, because she's she can trust to the level that she can trust mm. with him, whereas everybody else she doesn't know the level of trust. And and I think there's also an added difficulty is that the army is trying to groom men and women to get reason to fall in love with them. Mm -hmm. And once again, on the other side, having to stage happiness, maybe, or like love on, on the other end for the gentleman or woman who's Risa is supposed to be set up with. Once mm -hmm. again, that must further complicate the issue because how do you possibly act natural in that situation where you're being trained 
and you're right. in the pressure that you're this is your moment to try to save the world. I mean, is this doomed to failure just because you can't just make this happen that way? <laughs> I don't want to say it's doomed to failure, but it's it's uh, let's face it, failure is is the the default setting for most relationships. Any success, that is true. you know, any success is is wildly wonderful. So um, so yeah, it everything everything is hard in this comic. <laughs> well, I mean, before I got uh, before I, I met my wife, something I would say. Um, I was, I'm, I'm wonderfully, I'm wonderful at failing dates. I'd be really bad at them. I've had a long history of failures at dates. Um, what I would always say is um, you only have one successful relationship in your entire life. 